right. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? OK, fantastic. So really nice to see everybody. Uh, it's been a long time. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about some recent advances in constructions of proof-carrying data, or recursive SNARKs. This is joint work with a bunch of my excellent co-authors, Benedict, Alessandro, William, and Nick. All right, let's get started. Ooh. I guess all my animations just showed up all at once, but OK, we'll deal with it. So OK, so maybe let's motivate proof carrying data with an example. right? And given this is a blockchain conference, let's do a blockchain example. So let's say I'm a new user joining um, a blockchain system, right, or a blockchain network, and I want to verify the history. So what do I have to do? Well, first I have to figure out what a blockchain consists of. And it consists of the initial state, the history of transactions, and the final state that is supposed to be the result of applying those transactions to the initial state, right? So if I want to do this, uh, I have, if I want to check the history, I have to first download this entire set of transactions and the initial and final states. And then I have to sequentially apply each transaction in that history um, to the initial state until I get the final state, OK? Now, both of these steps, uh, they, they cause some hurdles, right? Just downloading the history itself can be expensive for popular blockchains such as Ethereum. For example, I think on Ethereum, it's like hundreds of gigabytes to download the existing chain. And then once you've done that, you still have to actually execute the computations in each transaction sequentially, starting from the initial state until you eventually get the final state, right? <clears throat> so, and this takes, for example, on Ethereum over a month. So put together, put, put together these two steps, they cause a, uh, they place a significant sort of um, lower bound on like the power needed to actually verify the history of these blockchain networks, right? And this really harms decentralization as only powerful nodes can check the history of the blockchain now. Okay, so what can we do to remedy this? And one very simple idea is to um, use succinct blockchains. Right, uh, is, to, is to use zk snox to construct succinct blockchains. So the idea here, sorry that animations really got, uh, I guess the PDF is being used. But I'll try to walk through the animations uh, verbally. All right, so now consider, so you know, the rough idea here is to basically, instead of having the new user who's joining the network check the entire history themselves, they just check a very succinct proof that the history is correct, that all the transactions are valid, and that applying them gives you uh, the final state, okay? And a little bit more formally, the idea here is to consider this blockchain transition function, which takes in uh, a previous state, the new state, and uh, some set of transactions or a block of transactions, and checks that applying the, that block of transactions to the initial state gives you the final state, okay? And to check the history of the blockchain, you basically just apply this function again and again and again over time until you go from the initial state to the final state. And you would use, how would you use the zk snark? You would uh, use the zk snark to prove this sequence of iterated applications of this blockchain transition function f. Uh, you would provide a proof that this sequence happened correctly, and you would give this to the user, who would then just simply uh, check this very short, very succinctly verifiable proof. Okay. So this is good from the user's perspective, but from the person, who, from the perspective of the person who's producing this proof, right? They have to do a lot of work. Because every time a new block is appended to the chain, they have to basically redo the entire proving work. They can't reuse any of the work that they did for block n minus 1 to prove now the history for block n. Right? They have to do everything all over again. And so this is very, very wasteful, right? because as you know, zk snark provers are not the most efficient things that you know, we have around. Okay. So to resolve this, people have come up with this notion of incrementally verifiable computation. And the idea here is that instead of producing for, for iterated computations, such as the one we saw in the previous slide, instead of producing just one monolithic proof for the you know, entire set of um, applications of the transition function, what you do is you sort of build up a proof as you go along, as the computation progresses. So at time zero, you have some initial state, and you get in, like, say, a block. You, the prover, the IVC prover at that point in time, produces a proof for just that application of the function. Um, and then when the next block comes in, you take that old proof, and you sort of update it with uh, the new information that you've just gotten. So the proof at time two will prove not only that one application of the function happened correctly, but also that the previous proof is correct. 
And so you sort of keep repeating this all the way until the end of time, until you have like a proof for the entire history of the chain. OK? Um, and the, basically, the takeaway is that at any given point in time, the prover only has to do work that corresponds to the effort of proving one function, uh, one application of the, of the transition function. OK? <clears throat> and in the end, you still get the same efficiency properties. You're, the verifier is still independent of the number of applications of this function. OK? So, all right, so this seems like a useful primitive. And in fact, people have generalized this not only for this you know, sequential uh, set of computations, but also to any DAG of computations. So computations could be interacting in any way possible as long as it forms a DAG. But in this talk, I'll just focus on incrementally verifiable computation because it's much simpler to understand. OK? So um, how do we use this IVC notion to construct succinct blockchains? The idea is very sim similar to what we just had on the previous slide. But instead of just producing an arbitrary ZK snark proof, what the IVC prover will provide is um, instead a, uh, an IVC proof, right? And the idea is that as a new block comes in, the IVC prover can simply update their existing proof very cheaply and produce a new proof for now the updated history of the chain. And then from the user's perspective, it looks the same. They still only have to verify one proof, which is independent of the length of the blockchain. And they don't have to download the entire history. Right? So there's both bandwidth savings uh, and um, computation savings for both the user and the prover. OK? All right. Um, so this basically means that weaker nodes can now participate in checking the history of the blockchain, and which improves the decentralization of the network. right? And this technique is being deployed already in existing chains such as Mina and potentially in the future uh, Zcash. Right? So it's improving uh, IVC would directly result in better efficiency and security improvements for many blockchains um, as we know them. All right. So this is fantastic. Um, but how do we actually construct IVC? Right? Like it seems like a magical primitive. Um, and the answer is that, OK, we rely on another semi-magical primitive, namely ZK snarks. Uh, so over the past, I guess, nine years now, um, or 10 years, uh, we've come to, you know, f the community has collectively figured out uh, both theoretical and concretely efficient constructions of IVC. But they all rely on a particular kind of ZK snark, namely a ZK snark where the verifier runs in time that is sublinear in the computation that is being proven. Right? So the verifier time is sublinear. So th you can think of like square root n, for example. Okay? Uh, so we know how to construct such snarks which have uh, sublinear verification, but we only know how to do the, how to construct these from relatively complex building blocks such as, you know, pairing-friendly elliptic curve cycles or complex probabilistic proof checking techniques, right? And together, all of these complex building blocks, when you put them together, they give you a system that is difficult to analyze from a theoretical perspective, but also. Uh, the implementation is difficult, which in turn hurts the concrete efficiency of these systems. Right? So ideally, what we want is an IVC scheme, which is very simple to describe and very easy to implement, and also uh, you know, efficient as a result. So can, the question that we want to ask is, can we construct IVC from simpler and more efficient primitives to get uh, yeah, simpler and more efficient IVC? And in this talk, I'll basically uh, go over this is really unfortunate, but we will work around it. Uh, yeah, we will go over two constructions of uh, two new constructions of IVC from uh, different classes of zk snarks. So the first is IVC or PCD from snarks which have atomic accumulation. So the idea here is atomic accumulation is a new, I guess, property of a zk snark scheme. And what we show is that any zk snark which has an atomic accumulation scheme can be used to construct IVC even if it does not have sublinear verification. So even if the verifier takes a linear amount of time to run, for example, like in Halo 2, you can use it to construct uh, IVC. All right? So this is nice. You know, we can have this new construction of IVC from snarks with accumulation. But how do you actually construct snarks with atomic accumulation schemes? So what we show is that if your snark is, or the snark verifier in particular, is mostly succinct, except for one portion which corresponds to, for example, polynomial commitment checks. 
And if that sub-portion itself can be accumulated, if those polynomial commitment checks can themselves be accumulated, then the SNOC as a whole has an accumulation scheme, right? <clears throat> so basically, we've reduced the task of constructing um, SNOCs with accumulation schemes to constructing, for example, polynomial commitments with accumulation schemes. And the good news is that this fairly, you know, it's much more straightforward to construct these accumulation schemes for polynomial commitments directly. And we show how to, cons how to do this for um, two popular commitment schemes, namely KZG and uh, inner product argument-based schemes. All right? So this is, this is you know, good news, good progress. Um, but at this point, what we have is construction of IVC from SNARKs where the verifier is linear, but the proof size must still be sublinear. We'll get into why this you know, is for in just a second, but this is you know, still a restriction. Uh, oh, and I wanted to acknowledge that a lot of the ideas in this work is sort of formalized and generalized ideas that first appeared in Halo um, or a few years back now. Okay. All right, so now we're at the stage where you know, we can construct IVC from SNOCs with uh, linear verifier but sublinear proof size. So in the follow-up work, we showed how to lift this restriction by constructing these recursive SNOCs or IVC uh, from proof systems which can have linear proof size. So we don't no longer have a restriction of sublinear proof size. You can, your proof size could be linear, quadratic, whatever you want, as long as it has uh, an accompanying um, property called split accumulation. So split accumulation is a, is a generalization of the atomic accumulation I talked about on the previous slide. Uh, but roughly, the takeaway is the same. As long as you have a proof system which has split accumulation, then you can use it to construct IVC, and there's no need for succinctness anywhere, uh, not in the proof system, not in, in the accumulation scheme. Okay? Then we show actually how to construct such split accumulation, or NARCs with split accumulation. In particular, we construct one for R1CS, where the accumulation verifier, which you can think of as roughly being what goes inside the recursive circuit, what, so the cost of that is just a constant number of uh, group operations, field operations, and random oracle invocations, or hash invocations, right? And compared to the work on the previous slide, this is much better, because that requires a logarithmic amount of uh, a number of all of these, okay? So, I mean, log versus constant doesn't seem like a big deal, but in, as we'll see on the last slide of the talk, it actually makes quite a big difference uh, when you get at concrete numbers. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to ask, stop for questions in the middle of the talk, uh, but if anybody has any questions about anything I said before, please ask. Afterwards? Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's take a deep breather before we dive into the technical part of the talk. All right. Okay, deep breath, let's go. So okay, before we start talking about how to construct IVC, let's just quickly formally or semi-formally define what IVC is. And the idea here is that there's two algorithms, an IVC prover and an IVC verifier. And what the IVC prover does is it wants to prove sort of combined two things. It wants to prove that one invocation of a function f happened correctly and that some you know, digest of all the prior accumulations is also valid. So in this case, you would call this digest the IVC proof, right? And what the prover shows is that one invocation of that function f is correct and that the previous proof pi is also correct, right? And it produces a new proof pi prime which uh, asserts, to this, uh, asserts this uh, claim. Okay, <clears throat> and the idea is that sort of, as you saw on you know, a couple of slides before, you can sort of keep repeating this. You can feed the output of the IVC prover to itself again and again and again until you're sort of done with all the iterations of your function f. Okay, we want two properties here. The first property is uh, completeness, which basically just says that if there is a valid IVC proof, then the IVC prover can take that valid proof and use it to continue the chain of computation. So you can use it to prove another claim or of uh, another invocation of the function f. All right, the second property is again very standard. It, says, it just says that you know, if there is a valid proof, then the IVC prover must have known some valid trans, uh, transcript of computation that corresponds to that proof. So there's some valid history that backs the proof that the verifier accepts, okay? 
And finally, from an efficiency perspective, what we want is that the size of the proof should not change as you, you know, go down the chain of computations. And also, the verified time should not increase with the number of um, time steps. OK? <clears throat> the second building block that we, that we want to talk about is you know, uh, ZK NARC or ZK SNARC. And basically, uh, I guess most people in this audience should be at a high level familiar with it. But basically, it's just a way for some prover to convince some verify that a claim is true. For example, that some circuit is satisfied um, on some private input, for example. And we want standard completeness and proof of knowledge properties. And optionally, we want sublinear proofs. This gives you a SNARC. And zero knowledge, this gives you a ZK SNARC. OK? All right. So let's see how we can first construct IVC from recursive composition of SNARCs. Again, this will be difficult um, because this stuff is covering what I wanted to say. But all right. So there's an IVC prover, right? And what the prover does is internally it invokes the SNARC prover. And the SNARC prover produces a proof for a very specific circuit that we'll call the recursive circuit. In this recursive circuit, it has two subcomponents. The first component is the function that you want to prove the correct execution of, namely this function f, right? Think of the blockchain transition function. And a subcircuit corresponding to the verifier of the ZK snark, right? So this V thingy that you see there, that what that does is it checks the previous IVC proof, right? So the snark prover produces a proof of this recursive circuit, which says that the function executed correctly and the previous proof was correct. And then it obtains a new proof, pi t plus 1, which it can then give to the verifier. And the verifier will be able to check this. It will run the snark verifier to check this proof. OK? And uh, yeah, basically, the, what's hidden behind the bubbles is that <coughs> uh, sort of completeness follows very straightforwardly from the completeness of the snark. Uh, knowledge soundness is a little bit more involved. You have to do some recursive ex extraction using the SNARK extractor. Um, and efficiency, basically, it follows from the fact that uh, if you have a SNARK where the proof size is sublinear, then the size of the IVC proof will also be sublinear, and things sort of work out. Uh, and this like, point about sublinearity is actually very important, because if, in this case, your proof size is linear, or the verifier circuit, therefore, is linear, right? your recursive circuit keeps growing as you perform more and more iterations, right? So that box for V, it keeps getting larger and larger and just keeps stretching out the recursive circuit. So at the end, basically, the IVC verifier's work will be quite, it will be proportional to the number of iterations of the computation. So that's, not, that's what we don't want. And hence, we must require that the SNARK has succinct or sublinear proof size, OK? So can we do better? Can we first sort of relax this requirement about sublinear verification? Um, all right, so let's see what we can do there. Um, so to tackle this, in BCMS20, we introduced this new tool called Atomic Accumulation. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the slide, but I'll walk you through it one by one. So the idea is basically that, <clears throat> a little bit more abstractly, what we want to do is that we have some predicate. Maybe we call this phi, right? And we want to prove that this predicate on a bunch of different inputs accepts, right? So phi of q1 is 1, phi of q2 is 1, phi of blah, 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 qn is 1. Okay? But the problem that we're facing is that this predicate phi is quite expensive, right? Think of this phi as being, for example, the SNARK verifier. And if you want to, const if you want to have a SNARK with, uh, for example, linear verification, then that phi is like linear in the circuit size. So atomic accumulation schemes, basically the goal of these things is to, is to reduce the cost of checking that this predicate on all these inputs accepts, right? So what happens is that <clears throat> there is this uh, accumulation prover, which takes an initially empty accumulator, this A0 object, takes in the query for the first, for the first accumulation query, right, this Q1 and produces a new accumulator A1, which basically uh, sort of aggregates Q1 into the existing accumulation, right? And this happens again and again and again until we reach the end of our sequence. So we've aggregated all of our Q1 through uh, Qt, OK? At each step, the accumulation prover takes the previous accumulator, takes one input, and spits out a new accumulator. All right, OK, so we have these accumulators. What do we do with these? 
Well, what, we, what we're able to do is we first want to check that the accumulation, each step of accumulation happened correctly. And this is where the accumulation verifier comes in, that orange V box at the top. And what it does is it checks that um, A1, for example, is a correct accumulation of Q1 and A0, so the previous accumulator and the new input. And you'd run this accumulation verifier for every time you run the accumulation prover, right? So V will check that A1 and Q2 are correctly accumulated into, Q, into A2 and so on and so forth until you get AT. Okay, so you run this accumulation verifier T times, and at the end you want to check that the final accumulator is actually, uh, you know, it's actually valid, is, uh, correctly aggregates all of this, um, all the queries that we just saw. And this is when you run the accumulation decider D. Right? And basically what we want here is that if all the accumulation verifiers accept and the accumulation decider also accepts, then it must be the case that the predicates would have accepted the accumulated inputs. Right? So this is, I'm, I'm talking very abstractly, but on the next slide we'll immediately see you know, what all this nonsense about predicates is. Okay? The efficiency property that we want is that the accumulation verifier should be much cheaper than the predicate itself. Um, so that the cost of running T of these verifiers and one decider is much less than the cost of running T of the predicates. Okay? All right. So, again, this is a bit covered up. But uh, the high-level idea is that what we do is we set the predicate to be the SNARK verifier. So the inputs to the predicate are just uh, the public input for the SNARK, the accumulator, and uh, a proof pi. And roughly how we modify, we, mo we modify the, the recursive circuit and the IVC prover as follows. So first, uh, the IVC prover, it runs the accumulation prover to accumulate the previous accumulator and uh, the previous proof and spits out a new accumulator, AI plus one, right? Now this AI plus one, is, uh, basically what we do is we set the recursive circuit instead of running the SNARK verifier, it simply runs the accumulation verifier to check that the proof pi i was correctly accumulated into AI plus one, okay? So we run this accumulation verifier, which is very cheap, remember, and it just checks that the accumulation happened correctly, and the rest of the circuit is unchanged. We just run the function f as before, and we, then we invoke the SNARK prover on this new recursive circuit. So this gives us a new pi i plus one and a new AI plus one. And then what happens is that the IVC prover, it runs the SNARK verifier and the accumulation decider to check that the accumulation and the proof are both correct. Okay? So roughly at the end of this, what we get is that um, the recursive circuit is independent of the SNARK verifier, right? So the SNARK verifier could be linear. It doesn't matter because it doesn't go inside the recursion. Okay? But now the new condition is that uh, accumulation verifier must instead be sublinear, right? And this imposes a condition on the accumulator and the proof because since those are being fed into the accumulation verifier, they must also be sublinear, right? If they were linear, then the accumulation verifier at least has to read them, which makes the, we, should, we should make its runtime linear, okay? <clears throat> so overall, we've relaxed the condition a bit. Now only our accumulation verifier needs to be sublinear. All right, uh, so this is basically a summary of this construction. We have a SNARK which has an atomic accumulation scheme, then you can get IVC or PCD. And this is the first construction of IVC that doesn't rely on SNARKs, uh, which have a sublinear verifier. And we inherit some nice properties of the building blocks. If the SNARK and accumulation scheme are zero knowledge and post-quantum secure, then so is your IVC or PCD scheme, okay? How do we actually construct these SNARKs from IVC, uh, sorry, these SNARKs which have atomic accumulation schemes? And as I promised before, basically we show how to do this for how to construct accumulation schemes for uh, two polynomial commitments, namely the KZG polynomial commitment and the IPA polynomial commitment. And we get some interesting properties uh, for these. All right. Okay. So, so far, uh, we've achieved a construction of IBC from SNARKs where the SNARK verifier uh, can be super, right, doesn't have to be sublinear, basically, right? But the proof and accumulator size must still be sublinear. And existing impossibility results for proof systems apply to these kinds of SNARKs still, which have sublinear size, right? You still must depend on um, non-falsifiable assumptions, for example. 
So can we lift this restriction? Can we work with proof systems where the proof size is linear, right? And this is where our second work comes in. And basically what we do is we generalize atomic accumulation into split accumulation. Again, there's a lot of stuff going on on this slide. But basically the takeaway is that split accumulation is very much like atomic accumulation. But we sort of split the predicate inputs into two parts, a short part and a long part. And we do the same for the accumulator. And the idea is that the accumulation verifier only reads a short part, the short part of these. It only reads a short part of the uh, query of the predicate input and a short part of the accumulator. And it is able to check that the accumulation happened correctly. Okay? So it doesn't have to read the potentially linear uh, sized uh, accumulator or, or input. All right? And the rest of the conditions are the same. If all of the invocations of the accumulation verifier accept and the decider accepts, then it must mean that the uh, predicates would also have accepted all the various inputs. Okay? <clears throat> and again, the diagram here for split accumulation very much resembles the one for atomic accumulation. The recursive circuit, again, only contains the accumulation verifier um, and not the snark verifier at all. The difference now is that the recursive circuit only gets the short portions of the accumulation input and the accumulation and the accumulator itself, right? In this case, the, uh, the accumulation input is as before the accumulator and the pi and the proof. So basically what we say is that we split up the proof into short and long parts and we feed only the short part into the accumulation verifier and simply for the accumulator. Okay? Yeah. Takeaway, high level takeaway is basically this is the same diagram as the previous one, except we've split up what we're feeding into the accumulation verifier. So the accumulation verifier only gets short uh, sub portions of it. Okay? Um, so this sort of, again, this, this formula is very much uh, similar to the previous one. You're, <coughs> you take a NARC and a split accumulation scheme for that NARC, and you're able to get IVC or PCD out of it. And so the first construction of IVC that doesn't rely on succinctness in any form or shape, right? You can take a linear size proof system and plug it in, and as long as, it, as you can construct a split accumulation scheme for it, you will get IVC from it, right? Uh, so actually, how do you actually construct such proof systems uh, which have um, split accumulation? Well, I won't go into details here because I'm running out of time, but Basically, the takeaway is that in the paper, we show how to construct uh, a proof system where the proof itself is just a single message from the prover to the verifier. You can just think of it as the NP witness. This is if you don't want zero knowledge. Um, and the <clears throat> split accumulation scheme for it is basically just a sigma protocol. And if you th think about it, sort of the first zero knowledge proofs that we knew how to construct were sigma protocols. So it's really nice that we sort of come full circle and are able to construct powerful primitives like IVC from just sigma protocols, right? And putting all this together means that we get IVC from very simple ingredients, right? Uh, and yeah, there's other fantastic properties such as no PCPs or linear PCPs or IOPs, anything in sight, which makes the analysis very, very simple, okay? <clears throat> okay, so does all this effort actually pay off? Can, can we actually use, I mean, what is the point of doing this if you don't get efficient, uh, more efficient IVC. It's basically, we compared uh, three different works. So BCTB14, like standard recursive SNOCs as we know them, uh, atomic accumulation-based SNOCs, and split accumulation-based SNOCs. And what we found was that um, split accumulation-based SNOCs are like, yeah, much, much cheaper, almost an order of magnitude cheaper than, uh, not order of magnitude. If you're talking in powers of two, maybe yes, uh, than the, uh, uh, existing constructions, right? So even more efficient than recursing with Grot 16. Um, so this is something that's uh, kind of mind blowing. Um, and it's, yeah, ideas based on this technique, uh, such as uh, Nova, such as follow up work, are being deployed, I think, are being explored for deployment with uh, different applications in Filecoin and uh, Ethereum and so on. Okay? Uh, so I think it's a very exciting area. Of, if you can reduce the costs lower than 50K for a recursive circuit, that would be. Uh, kind of mind blowing, um, and uh, yeah, just very interesting in general. Okay, sort of that wraps up my talk. I think I have 30 seconds left. Um, so yeah, you can find the work at these two links uh, on ePrint.
Thank you. There's uh, several questions on Discord, so please uh, follow up and follow okay. the conversation there. I will do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.